the foe. Every heart will be light and his face will be bright when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow or heartaches will come, there'll be no place like heaven, my home, when all of God's singers get home. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away, fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. Shadows of this life have grown. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Like a bird from prison bars is flown. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away. Oh glory, I'll fly away, fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away, fly away, fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away, fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away, fly away. I think we're about ready to, to get started this evening. We invite you to come on in and we'll be opening up to Matthew chapter 9 tonight and trying to go a little further in our study of the different miracles that we find in Matthew chapters 8 and 9. And we'll try to progress a little down through that this evening. But before we get started, we do always want to start with prayer and especially prayer that remembers those who are uh, particularly on our minds. And uh, there are I'm sure are some updates and things like that that we'd like to get out in front of us. And I'd like to start with uh, Brother Stan. Stan was telling me that he had talked to Demar and uh, had some uh, good conversation with him. And Stan, could you kind of just tell everybody what you were saying? Yeah. Uh, 
he's doing a lot better. Uh, in fact, he's he's walking, you know, two or three times a day. Well, probably three times a day, uh, and he's trying to walk at least uh, four miles a day. And he's losing weight too. He says he's, he's dropped a lot of weight. He's on a diet, uh, and he's feeling. He, he thanked the church for praying for him, you know, but keeping him in our prayers. Uh, he was real grateful for that. He said that probably got him a long way towards recovery. But uh, like I said, he's doing fine. And uh, he was, he asked, uh, could he go down to Georgia because he wanted to come visit with us. And, uh, uh, his doctor told him not quite yet. It maybe about six weeks. Well, we'll keep praying for that. Maybe he'll be able to get down here by the end of the Well, he said to keep fall. on praying for him. He, he wants the prayer. <laughs> yeah. well, that's great news to hear. To thank, and where all the surgery he has had on his hips and his back and everything for him to be walking four miles a day. They cut him almost all the way around. That's, an, that's incredible. Yeah. Goodness. But we're sure glad for his recovering like he has. That's just great news on that. Uh, somebody else maybe have another update of someone doing better or anything. Any news like that. Uh, we do want to thank, uh, keep some others on our, our prayer list tonight. We want to continue to remember uh, Brother Al's family, Mary Jean and Bernie and, and Gary and Dale and all of them. We want to keep them in our prayer. And I think we also would like to remember the Garen family and the Medlaws. Uh, uh, Scott, how are you doing tonight? I'm, I'm good. I sleep the doctor Friday. He's done a good update. Okay. All right. You go this Friday, you say? That's right. Okay. Very good. Well, let's remember Scott in our prayer tonight, too. Does anybody else have someone else to maybe add to the list for the season? It's Rachel. Oh, all right. All right. Have you got any new word on her by chance, Phil? I do not. I haven't seen anything. Anyone else? Maybe I know they send out a news clip every, or a news update every now and then, but I haven't seen one. I, I didn't know if somebody else might have got it or not. Okay. Safe travel for Kevin back to Virginia tomorrow. Oh boy, that's a drive right there. How far? How long does it take you to get there? Ooh, <laughs> 11 hours, okay. Well, it's been great having you here with us. Uh, we'll remember Kevin as he makes his trip back back to Virginia. Uh, Brother Jim takes the test too. Let me take him treatment. Has, how's yours been going for you, Brother Jim? I just get real tired when, you know, after the treatment, but yeah. only got three more to go, so okay. I'll be okay. Okay, all right. Uh, well, let's keep Jim in our prayer, too, this evening. Anyone else, maybe? You might want to bring someone up for us. Uh, I did want to mention a little. Steve, you got something? Go ahead. Well, we need to pray for Lori, don't we? <laughs> well, congratulations. Is this y'all's 20th anniversary today? Well, how about that? How about that? Congratulations on that. <laughs> uh, Cheryl's dad got some uh, news that he's going to have to go in for some additional surgery on his bladder and that's coming up pretty soon and uh, uh, so I'd like for us to remember him uh, in our prayer. He's 93 uh, 93 years old and still drives a little bit in Miami. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's, uh, that's the way it is there. Yeah, it is. It does. He goes and gets his mail in his Mustang that he had the motor just rebuilt in. And uh, he, I'm serious, man. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but he's in... Uh, you know, he's doing okay, but they found this when they did a check on him the other day, and they, they've got to go back in and take a look at it. Uh, and Cheryl's going to have some tests done this week, too. She's, 
she's home, not feeling good at all. And uh, she's got to go in. She went to Dr. Anderson today, and he's sending her for some other things. And, uh, so I'd uh, like for, for y'all to remember her, too. Anyone else, perhaps, you might want to mention? Well, let's take a minute just to open with a prayer then, and then we'll try to get into our, our study. <clears throat> Almighty God and Father in heaven, we come before you this evening, Lord, and are thankful to know that, that you are our God and that the one who created all the world around the us that we see and that we experience is you, and that we're grateful, Father, to be a product of your hand. And we pray, Heavenly Mount Father, tonight for many of these that we've been thinking about. We're so grateful for the improvement in Brother DeMar. And we pray that that would continue in that direction. And perhaps soon, sometime in the next few months, he will be able to begin to get out again and, and to visit with people. We pray, Father, that you would watch over our Brother Marcel as he continues through uh, his treatments and that they would finish up well and that, uh, have good results from that. And we pray that you be with Kevin as, as he drives back to Virginia and on the long trip that he has ahead of him. We pray, Father, that you'd be with our Rachel Guest. Watch over her and, and her family, especially as she faces these new treatments that she'll be going through. And we pray, Father, for good news for Scott as he goes to his doctor on Friday. And we pray that he might be able to receive some encouraging information then. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that, that you be with uh, Cheryl's dad and with Cheryl and the things that they're uh, feeling at this hour and that you'd be with, with him especially as he undergoes his surgery soon. And we pray, Father, for the Garen family and for the Armstrong family. And we ask, Lord, that you'd watch over Mary Jean and, and Gary and Bernie and Dale and all the family and that you'd bless them and, and help them to find strength in you. Be with us as we study, Lord. Help us to open our hearts and minds to, the, to your ever-abiding word that will never go away. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to be encouraged by what we see there and to put our faith in you. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would like to open up to Matthew chapter 9, we want to try to take a look at, actually, it's, it's two miracles uh, tonight, but they're kind of uh, co-joined together, and we want to look at them that way. And it starts at verse 18 and runs down to about verse 26. Not very long reading, really, uh, to contain two different miracles, but this is Matthew's account of it. And as we've noted in other miracles of this study, that Mark and Luke also uh, contain uh, some additional information on these. But we're going to try to keep our focus in Matthew primarily tonight and, and see as we study down through this what things we can discover here. We'll start at verse 18 and we'll read down through about verse 26 here. While he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for twelve years came up behind him and touched him on the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will get well. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. And at once the woman was made well. When Jesus came into the official's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder, he said, Leave, for the girl has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. This news spread throughout all the land. I'd like for us to notice here that from verse 18 down to verse 26, we have uh, the briefest account given of two uh, tremendous miracles that, that happened here. 
One is, is that Jesus raises a little girl from the dead. And the other is, is that we find a woman who had been suffering with a, a, a hemorrhaging problem for 12 years uh, was also healed instantaneously. And you might think that Matthew would have spent a little bit more time than what he does here on these two miracles. If you go to Mark, uh, Robert, you got something? Yeah, what, is, what does it mean he says when he says that she's not dead, she's asleep? Yeah, we're going to talk about that some. Uh, we'll get to that in just a few minutes, if you, if you would. Uh, but before we get to that part, which is a component that we want to try to look at here for a minute, about why is it referred to death as sleeping here, which we'll, we'll see a little bit about that. But I'd like for us to notice that when you look at Mark's account, his account is about three times as long. Well, which book is longer, Matthew or Mark? Matthew is. Uh, but when Mark talks about things, he generally gives a much fuller account of it. Uh, he doesn't talk about everything the other Gospels have in them, but the things that he does are often uh, expanded, and you get additional information that aren't found like in Matthew or in, in Luke. Luke's uh, is longer too, but um, and we get some important tips from him about this situation. The first miracle being with the girl. It's Luke that tells us that the girl is how old? She's 12 years old. 12 years old. Now, what grade in school are, are 12 year olds? Sixth or seventh grade, something like that. Twelve years old. A young girl. A young girl. Uh, and how long had this woman had her problem? Twelve years. Twelve years. That's kind of an interesting thing to, to couple those two things together. It, the entire length of life of the little girl uh, is how long that woman had had her problem of hemorrhaging. And so you look at this and you see maybe a commonality there, but there are some other things that we would like to notice here too. But first of all, let's take a minute to notice a couple of other things about this young girl. Uh, we know uh, that she is 12 years old. And do we know anything else about her? Uh, uh, some, some information about her uh, and her family perhaps. Does anybody pick up anything on that? Yes. Okay. We we get the name of of the, of the synagogue official uh, that's given to us, and again, that's something that is not supplied by Matthew, but as Brother Charlie said, is in Luke or rather Mark. Uh, and as he said, uh, do you notice any other information that we can can gather here about her? Her dad's name. We know that. Anything else? Okay, all right, she's at the point of death, uh, and that's kind of, uh, that's, that's where we're at, and that kind of gets to part of what Robert's getting at here, too, about sleep and death, and we want to kind of look at that in a minute. Uh, at the point of death, about to die, uh, the thing is, is that she's looking at, she's staring death right in the face here, uh, and uh, she, she is, in fact, someone that we find out, does she die, in fact? Yes, she does. And uh, Jesus raises her uh, from the dead and, and does this. And so as we look at this, uh, we might notice that how many children does this synagogue official have? One. Now this is interesting to look at here. You look at Matthew 9 and verse 18, and we see, you know, the daughter is made mention of there. Uh, and it is over in the Gospel of Luke, if you look in chapter 8 and verse 42, that it tells us she's his only daughter. Now you might say, okay, uh, what's so powerful about that? Well, what's interesting about it is, is the word only. Uh, is the Greek word monogenes. And monogenes is the word God used to describe Jesus. My only begotten son. How many children did God have like that? One. Yeah, he had one. And that's Jesus. 
Uh, and so you, you look at this, and it's interesting that that word is used in two or three different places. You remember the, the young man who was being buried, and his mother was accompanying the coffin, and Jesus reached out and stopped the process. Remember that? And the text says he was her only son, you say. Uh, so that kind of adds to the depth of what we're looking at in this situation, uh, that this man had just a daughter, and only one, one daughter. And this was, a, this was something that was certainly uh, very terrifying for him. Uh, now, in addition to that, do we know the girl's name or anything like that? No, we don't know her name. Uh, we don't know that part of her. Uh, but we do know that she's at death's door. And we do know uh, that Jesus has come. And that those who were surrounding the house when Jesus got there had determined that she was dead. Yeah, yeah. So they were so convinced of it uh, that they laughed when Jesus said, no, she's just sleeping. Uh, and so when we look at, at that, uh, we kind of get a picture that you couldn't have a more drastic scene than for a family to lose a child, an only child, a daughter in this particular case. And that's what's here. Can somebody else maybe add another uh, picture here that we might draw out of the scene that we see uh, when Jesus goes with this man and gets there? What does he find? What does Jesus find when he gets to the house? What's it like? Large crowd. And uh, what's the crowd doing? They're in a state of commotion, disorder. Yes. Uh, uh, in fact, we're told uh, that they are. There are some there that are. Um, I guess you almost might say professional mourners. You know, uh, they're they're playing mournful dirges and things like that, and, and wailing and these sorts of things uh, are going on. Would you expect sorrowful things at a scene like this? Sure, sure you would, uh, but it was uh, rather chaotic uh, when you find the description here that's given about this. Uh, and what does Jesus do about that? How does, he, how does he react when he first gets to the man's house? What does he do? The first thing he does. Tells everybody to go away. Yeah. Yeah. Says, Y'all need to leave. And send them away. He did. And now, Matthew doesn't tell us this, but uh, the other Gospels accounts do. Who does he take up to the room the child is lying in? He takes only certain people up there. Yes? Peter, yeah, Peter, James, and John, and the parents. That's all he would allow to go up there in the upper room. Peter, James, and John and also uh, the parents themselves. Uh, and they are taken into the room where the little girl uh, was at. Uh, so you, you get the picture here of chaos and all kinds of commotion going on. Jesus sends that away, takes the family and the parents anyway upstairs where the child is and takes three apostles with him up there. Peter, James, and John. Where are some other places we see Jesus pick out Peter, James, and John. Mount of Transfiguration is a big one. The Garden of Gethsemane is a big one. Uh, Jesus uses them uh, many times. Uh, kind of uses them as an inner circle, you might say, uh, among the apostles, Peter, James, and John. Uh, now, uh, in considering this for a minute, we might want to notice that there are a couple of things that we want to pick out here about Jarius and what he says uh, that I think ought to stand out to us. When he comes up to Jesus uh, and he says, my daughter has died, uh, what, is it, what does he ask of Jesus? What does he expect of Jesus? To come. to come. That's one thing he wants him to do is come. Lay his hand on her. Lay his hand on her, yes. What's, what, does he, what does he anticipate here? She will live. You come and touch my daughter, lay your hand on her, and she will live. Not she might, 
Not there's a chance. There's a possibility. She <coughs> will live. Brother Gold. You notice that Jesus is taking his time about doing all this. He's not in a hurry. He knows he's going to do it. Yeah. And, but I think he, he drags his feet, as it were, for the benefit of those mm -hmm. around him. Like, you know, I'll take care of this. Just hold your horse. Kind of like. Yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's his attitude, and he, he does take his time. But it doesn't matter. He's going to do it. Yes. Anyway. Yes. Uh, he knows what he's going to do. And it's, he does it in such a way that, you know, he doesn't do it in the middle of a, a chaotic scene. He does it in front of the parents and three apostles. Now, did other people figure out what had happened? Yes. Absolutely they did. Uh, and they were dumbfounded by it. Kind of like what happened when he raises Lazarus from the dead. Uh, and in fact, there's a couple of common things there between Lazarus and John 11 and this little girl here. Uh, Maybe this is as good a time as any to, to take a look at that. Do you remember, if you flip over to John chapter 11, and you remember the scene where the messengers had come to Jesus and they said, uh, the one whom you love, uh, you know, is sick, come help him, and uh, Jesus waits. <laughs> he, he tarries all behind the ways. And then finally, you know, they find out uh, that he has, in fact, uh, died. And uh, Jesus describes that a little bit. Let's, let's look at this for just a minute. In John chapter 11, uh, let's take a look there uh, at verse 11 and 12. Let's get both of those verses. John 11, 11 and 12. This he said after uh, that he had said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen what? Asleep. But I go so that I may awaken him out of his sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken, verse 12 or 13 goes on to say, Jesus had spoken of his what? Death. Death. Uh, but they thought he was speaking of his actual literal sleep. Uh, all right, that's what they... Uh, are thinking here. Uh, but Jesus uh, has to plainly tell them that he is in fact dead, uh, but we're going. And he gets there and Jesus raises him from the dead. How long had he been dead? Four days. He'd been in the tomb for four days. Uh, he, that's how long he had been dead. Now, Jesus kind of uses the same language there that Lazarus was a uh, Sleep, And over here, uh, you know, you kind of find this kind of parallel here, too, because Jesus says of this girl that she is what? Asleep. asleep. But what did Jesus mean by sleep? She had died. Yeah. He used it by Lazarus. He was dead. He was dead. Uh, now, why would you, why would you use a term like sleep to compare it to death in, in these particular scenes here. Would it be the fact that he knew he was coming back to life? Yeah. Because the body without the soul is dead. Christ was going to put the soul back in this Yes. That, that is what will happen here. Uh, she uh, is going, she is uh, she's asleep in the sense that she's temporarily out of this. But she's coming back to life. It's not to say that uh, soul sleeping, as some would call it, uh, is, is a, a real phenomenon. That you, your spirit is, is still with your body when it's entombed and that sort of thing. That's not what this is talking about. Uh, we know the spirit does what when it departs from a body? Yes, it, it goes back to God who gave it. And we know even more than that, don't we? There are yes, yes. Uh, there are two places that, that the soul awaits the day of judgment. Uh, paradise is one way we describe one side of it. The other side uh, is uh, the place of, of punishment and torture. Uh, you know, and that uh, description given to us in the rich man Lazarus 
uh, scene in, in the Gospel of Luke uh, helps us to see that the Spirit's not in the ground or in the sea or anywhere else where a person's deceased body might be resting. Uh, the Spirit doesn't rest in the deceased body. Uh, Philip just said a second ago that death is what? A separation of what? The body and soul. Yes, yes. Uh, so it, it isn't the case that the, that the soul is, is present with the body in the tomb. That's not the case. What is the case is that when you raise somebody from the dead, the spirit does what? It re yes, yes it does. And that's precisely what's going on right here. Uh, it, it is, I think, important to see that this isn't something new in the Bible, to use that kind of terminology. And Brother Lewis, I put a quote from Brother Lewis in here about this. He, it was such a, a good description, I think, that I included it here. But he reminds us of what it says in Daniel chapter 12 and in verse 2 about sleeping and its association with the description of death itself. And if you want to, let's, we can flip back over there for just a minute and see that one. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, and this is really a, a powerful verse in and of itself, but let's just notice, notice what it says here for a second. Uh, Brother Charlie, can you read it for us? If yeah, you would, sir. Yes, sir. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting What's that talking about? Does anybody figure, figure it out? Yeah, yeah, there's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a resurrection. And judgment's going to follow that. Well, that's a, a powerful verse to look at here with this. And it, kind of, it describes those who are in the dust of the ground as those that are what? Asleep. You know, that's, that's kind of the way it pictures. Brother Gold? I have a collection of old pictures on the collection at my house. One of them is chorus goes, Mother's not dead, she's only sleeping, patiently waiting for Jesus to come. <laughs> okay. The, guy, that, the person who wrote that song understood what was sleeping. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there is a, I, I think it's important that we realize that the body is, is there, sure, it's interred wherever it may be, uh, but that the soul is with God in the place that it's supposed to be at. And uh, the resurrection occurs uh, when all those who are in the tombs, what? Yes, they're raised. They hear his voice and they are raised back to life. John 5, 28, 29. Uh, the great resurrection picture there. It, it's not as if all the, the spirits are in, in the cemetery. They're not in the cemetery. They're not there. Uh, the, the body is, but not the spirit. The spirit's with God. But when the resurrection occurs, it is pictured as a bodily resurrection, is it not, in John 5? Uh, all of those who are in the tombs will be raised to life. Uh, and that's, that's a scene that's repeated over again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, that we should comfort one another with these words. What words? That those who have died in the Lord will be raised first and they will meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with him. You know, and uh, that's, that is the picture of, of what we see here. It's all consistent, really, uh, when, you, when you look at it on that. Somebody else maybe, I, I don't mean to be dominating here, Somebody else maybe bring up the thought, Brother Hugh. This is about the soul raising the, the young girl from the dead. That tells us and shows us Christ has authority and over the soul and the body. Yes. He has all authority. Yes. Now, also, what you've been saying here is nobody's in heaven right now. Right. I mean, Not people in the say, final oh, sense. Oh, they're in heaven. They become judges. There's got to be a judgment day. All of us are going to face that judgment. Yes. And you'll hear, if you're right, you'll, you'll hear, enter. But people that will, will say, oh, they're in heaven. No, they're not. 
The soul is not with God yet. So when you say that, you put yourself in the judgment place. You are not a judge of the soul. We are not. No. So we need to be careful yes. when we preach or we talk somebody into heaven. That's not our job. It's not our job to, to pass judgment like that. That's not our job to pass judgment like that. But Christ but, has all authority, and so he can call him back into the body. Yes. The because once the soul leaves, the body's dead. Yes, it is. Uh, I think... I think, you know, uh, it, it's too easy sometimes to, um, to maybe want to say so-and-so is in heaven. Now, when we say uh, that we know where they are going, is that, can we say something like that? In some cases? Yes. Yes, we can. You're being careful, though. Yes, well, uh, we... Well, we what did John write in 1 John 5, 13? That you may know. That you may know that you have eternal life. Uh, can you know that? We may know. But does anybody else know that we have? Yeah. Because right. People, what we have to do is look at, at, at what fruit has been produced in a life. And I, have, gives us I have things in my life that nobody knows about. Yes. And Lord, I hope we don't find out. But I hope the Lord will also forgive me of those things. Well, he has. Right. You know, and it does anybody. But I, I just, I have a problem with people preaching or putting people in heaven. And it's, no, it's not there. And technically, it's not heaven. The Bible, big part? Technically, it's not heaven. Right. Par it's paradise. There will be a judgment. And then uh, you will be asked to give account of yourself to God on the day of judgment. And then the gates of heaven will be open for those uh, that God allows in. One more thing. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of us said well, all our sins. Christ will not see our sins if we're a member of the church and we've been faithful. So those sins have been washed away. His blood continually yes. washes those away. Yes. So when we stand before judgment as a faithful Christian, we will have nothing in our against us. Because that's been washed away. Right. Forgiveness is forgiveness. You know, are, are you forgiven or not? Are you and, saved and you or not? You can never remember them again. That's the beautiful part. Yes. You, know. you yes. cannot remember those things. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Somebody else might be wanting to add a thought there. David. Yes, ma'am. Are we saying that it is just the spirit that goes after death to paradise or to cars? Mm -hmm. Is that what we're saying? Yes. And then whenever judgment I think it's talking about a physical resurrection. And then it says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, what happens? We are all changed. Into a body that's immortal. Yes. Immortal. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. This mortality, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, must put on what? Immortality. Yes. Right. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. All right. Make sure we were all on the same page. Okay. All right. Now, someone else maybe have a, a thought or a comment for a moment. But Phil? Even though it was the spirit that is in paradise, it was recognizable. Yes, absolutely it was. Uh, who recognized Lazarus? Well, the rich man. Yeah. <laughs> he re recognized Abraham, who you probably never had seen. Yes. And, you know. And so did the rich man. He recognized uh, Lazarus. I mean, yes. Abraham. Yes, yes, and you know, uh, interestingly enough, well, Marianne mentioned a minute ago, the Mount of Transfiguration. Charlie, do you want to say That's something? What I was going to say. Go ahead, go ahead. It's interesting that those apostles who did not know Moses were the Yeah, it is. Now, you, you can talk about, well, how'd they know that that was Moses? How'd they know that was Elijah? Well, the conversation Jesus was having with them, for sure, you know. Uh, I'm sure that it was something about it, but you know, there are things about our identity, I think, uh, that we don't fully grasp, but we stay who we are. We are a, 
we, we are an individual uh, that never loses that individual identity. And whether you, we talk about fingerprints and retinas in your eyes and all those sorts of things we use as identity markers, I think there are other kinds like that uh, that are even more powerful than that that mark us as individual people. And when we die, we are still the same person we were. It's just we're in a different state, one might say. Uh, Jim, do you have something else? In answer to that question, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? This is a comic answer. But it, well, Moses the one had two tablets in his hand, <laughs> and Elijah's clothes were singed. Oh, they singed from, from the fire. Right yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that always quite some day. Tipped them off. Okay, you know, they, they get quite some days. All right, all right. And someone else maybe have a thought there. <laughs> What about the people that came out of the tomb at the death of Christ? Yes, that's an interesting uh, study, to say the least. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, yes. They were recognized by many of us. Yes, yes. Uh, Lazarus came back from the dead. <coughs> uh, it's, I think when one looks at the, those scenes like that, what eventually happened to Lazarus? He died. Yeah. Yeah, uh, You know, if you think about it, from the moment we are conceived, we have a soul. Yes. That soul is immortal. It's going to exist somewhere. Yes. In some capacity for all eternity. From that moment forward, I have a theory about those that were resurrected. Okay. It's just strictly a theory. So if you think about Lazarus, <laughs> think about those that, that were raised when Jesus, you know, his resurrection on. I believe those people were saved. I believe that God knew they would still be saved, even if they were resurrected. Yes. It wasn't that he resurrected somebody that was lost. And now they yes. get a redo. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, they, you know, I believe the people that were resurrected were already in paradise. When they came back to earth, they would remain faithful. And when they died again, they would return to paradise. God in his infinite wisdom would know that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. But really. it would, you know, Likewise, if I'm in paradise and, and I come back and now I go off the deep end spiritually, well, <laughs> you know, how, how do you how do you reconcile that? Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I don't think it changed <coughs> one iota yeah. the spiritual status of those people that were resurrected. Very good. Very good. Phil, you want to add something? Well, I, I know we're not told how long those people walked among us right. when they were resurrected. Was right. that, you know, I guess my thought would be, why in the world would I want to resurrect and come back to the earth and come to the paradise? I'd be like, oh, wait now, I, I send hell, I don't want to go. I yeah, mean. yeah. Well, you, you know the thing, what was the purpose of that? You know, it, 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 we look at them as being uh, righteous persons who uh, were recognized as being righteous persons. And it talks about they, they were saints of old. I, I forget exactly the description that's given there. But uh, that was something that, you know, you look at and it was a positive thing. It wasn't... A, it wasn't the kind of thing I don't think that you would say, okay, well, let's send the rich man back, like McGarry said. That's just not, not going to work that way. Uh, who, who sent them back? Yes, yes. Who's the only one they could have? Yes, yes. When is it all the time it happened? Yes. <laughs> During Christ's life and his death. Yes, yes. How says it happened before? Yeah, uh, and you know, you, you think about uh, you think about these things, the resurrection, and you think about uh, this girl being brought back to life. 
Jesus raised from the dead many individuals. This little girl is just one of them. There's no telling how many people he resurrected from the dead. We don't have them all listed in the New Testament. We have a few that are listed. We don't have all the miracles listed either. We just have a select few that have been put in. Uh, Yes. Don't you think that the spirit that came up from the grave and appeared to many in the city were exactly that? Like, like, uh, like Samuel's appearance was? <laughs> yeah, in that they knew who they were. Mm -hmm. There was something right about them. Well, uh, the... The specter of looking at the Witch of Endor and Samuel uh, is is fascinating she was shocked as to what happened there she didn't she knew she was a charlatan she you know the people that do that kind of stuff seances and all that they know that that doesn't happen oh they might hallucinate or something if they help themselves along a little bit but uh, the fact is is that the only way Samuel could have spoken the things that he did was as who said he could. Yes. And that's the whole key to that to me. It's not the witch had power to do nothing. She didn't. But God sent a message to Saul that what was going to happen to him. He was going to die the next day in battle and he did at Mount Gilboa and so did his, his sons. You know. Uh, Jonathan uh, died up there too, unfortunately for him. Uh, but you think that's part of them recognizing? I'm sorry. In, on the Mount of Transfiguration, little yeah. divine recognition. Yeah, yeah. Since they had not lived concurrently with those people. Right, that they, they had. Yeah, and that's what's really intriguing about all of it. You know, it, is uh, you will know as you have been known. <laughs> It, it really makes you sit down and reflect a little bit. Uh, Brother Jim, and we'll have to wrap her up. <laughs> in, in support of what McGarry was saying, the King James calls those that were risen at the, at the uh, crucifixion were saints. Yes, yes. Which to me means that they yes. were under the law and had observed the law to the best of their ability. And were faithful. They were faithful people. I yeah. think so too. Stay. I'm going to recognize it, Paradise. What age would I recognize you? <coughs> I mean, you know, I've known you yeah. 50 years. Would I recognize you from then or now? Or? Well, I think that's that's part of the thing about identity. You know, we we don't look the same as we did when we were 16 or 24 yeah. or something. You know, well, you uh, had huh? You had hair. <laughs> and it wasn't this color, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's that's the thing. I don't think that that is the chief kind of identifier. I don't think we're going to see aging in the sense that we know it now represented in in the new form that God's going to give to us on that day. Mm -hmm. That we'll just know who's who. Yeah, yeah. There's something that's going to identify us other than than uh, whether I have hair or don't, you know, kind of thing. And, <coughs> and that, so I, but we're not told exactly what that is, but we are told that, that we will be remembered and our name's going to be on a ledger somewhere or it's not going to be. <laughs> and, and that'll be revealed too. Wait, isn't uh, the gate narrow? Uh, hey? Isn't the gate narrow? Yes, it is. Yes. Well, that's scary. Yes, it is. It, sh and it should be scary to us. For if the righteous are scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Uh, we ought to be uh, very conscious of that. <coughs> very much so. Well, we need to stop. There's folks wanting to come in, and we'll pause here for tonight and appreciate everyone's help this evening in our, our class.
And I'll explain to you what I mean. But to put Hebrews chapter 11 in context, you know, when you read the Bible, you read a verse. To understand that verse, you probably need to read a few verses before that one and then a few verses after that one to kind of get things in context. So if you start in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Why would the writer of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit, guide them to start out with that. Well, look at verse 35 of Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while. And he who is coming will come and will, tar will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, he's setting the stage. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. In other words, the Hebrew writer is saying, you got to move forward. Don't worry about the here and now. You need to be moving forward. You need to be looking ahead spiritually. As to what's ahead. And then he starts out. Because he said the just shall live by faith. He defines faith. There in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand. That the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch, one of only two people who never tasted of literal death, as you might say, by, fe by faith, Enoch was taken away, so he did not see death. It was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God without faith. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he has rewarded those who diligently seek him. Now, up in this to this point, I'm really intimidated. I'm extremely intimidated. I'm intimidated through the whole chapter, but I get a little less intimidated. Let me explain. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Well, we know the story of Noah. Preached. Never converted a soul, but he was still successful because he kept his fa family saved, right? He was still successful in that regard. If we can keep our family, if we can take our family to heaven with us, we are successful. Technically, if we can get to heaven alone, we are successful, okay? But the Bible is inspired word of God. And one of the ways that we know the Bible is inspired word of God is it doesn't hide the sins of our biblical heroes. You read about Noah. The Bible says that's the flood. He planted a vineyard. Got drunk on the proceeds. Put a stumbling block before his children by which Ham, one of his children, was actually cursed. That was Noah's fault. But Ham had to bear the consequences. Verse 8. But yet Noah's in the Hall of Fame. By faith, Abraham. Abraham's considered the, you know, father of the faithful, you might say. By faith, Abraham o obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. 
great man, father of the faithful. God promised Abraham, through your seed, all nations will be blessed. And yet Abraham lied two times to save his own skin. And yet God had already promised him that through his seed, all nations would be blessed. But he lied about his wife being his sister, which technically she was his half-sister. But that wasn't the point. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child, which she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Well, we know the story. That wasn't initially the case. Initially, Sarah was not convinced that that was going to happen. As a matter of fact, she kind of laughed about it. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerably as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were sure to them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they deserve, desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared them a city for them. And he goes on in verse 17, talks about Abraham again, right? Talks about Isaac, talks about Jacob, talks about Joseph, talks about Moses in chapter 23. Moses, godly man. Moses was a murderer at one time. That's why he had to flee Egypt. He killed somebody. He was a little reluctant to go back to Egypt, but he went anyway. Godly man, but yet God said, speak to the rock. Moses struck the rock, kept him from going into the land of promise. He disobeyed God. Still a godly man, but yet he had sins. If we go on, talk about Moses, okay? By faith forsook Egypt. We go on to... Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were enriched for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab, a prostitute, is in the faith hall of fame. This same prostitute is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. You see, that gives, you, you see where I'm going? When you look here, and it even talks about David. It talks about David, my favorite Bible character. I mean, David was a man's man. He had the looks. He had fame. He had fortune. He was a musician. He had all kind of talent. I mean, he was a warrior. I mean, he was a man's man. He was also a murderer. He was also a liar. He was also an adulterer. He was also a terrible father. And yet... He's described as a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he had a penitent heart. You see, when you read Hebrews chapter 11, it's easy to get very, very, very intimidated. Until you look back and you think about and you look that God doesn't hide the shortcomings and the sins of even these great Hall of Famers. Because the, perp the point is, they kept on keeping on. Faithfulness is when you sin, you repent of those sins, you are serious, right? You mean it, and you keep on keeping on. The Bible will tell us, as we've already read, that without faith it's impossible to please God. Where do we get faith? Well, if you see on the screen, that's where we get it. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. People will tell you in religion or in anything they do in life, I'm doing it. This is what I believe. I'm doing it by faith. The Bible tells you that we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You can't do anything by faith unless it is according to God's word. It's impossible. And the Bible tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without obeying the gospel that you see there on the screen, if you're not a Christian tonight, 
You've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You've got to be willing to repent of your sins. You've got to be willing to confess Christ. You've got to be willing to put on Christ in baptism and have your sins washed away. And then also you have to be willing to remain faithful or do your best to remain faithful thereafter. That's faith. That's what it takes to please God. So, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, today is the day of salvation. But maybe you have obeyed the gospel, but you're not walking by faith. You're not doing that. If you're not doing that, it's impossible to please God. Through penitence, confession, and prayer, you can get back right with God tonight. If we can help you in any way, would you please come as together we stand and sing. Thy child sweetly reigns over.